Hi, I'm Juliet Schooling Latter from Fun Calibre, and today I'm talking to George Cook, manager of the elite rated Montanaro European Income Fund. George, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Uh, dividends, or rather dividend cuts, uh, are rather a worry for inve income investors at the moment. Um, so perhaps we can start with your views on the outlook for dividends um, in your fund and the wider market. Uh, I notice, for instance, that your second largest country allocation is to France, um, where there's been almost a, a blanket ban on dividend payments by the government. Yes, uh, and so we we do expect dividends uh, to fall this year. Um, but I think as you sort of alluded to there, this is as much political as it is anything else. Uh, so we have companies that have got net cash on the balance sheet, which uh, sort of the fundamentals of those businesses are, are holding up pretty well, um, and yet they are cutting or postponing their dividends. Um, for political reasons, because they've they've essentially been told, you know, it's not a good look uh, to be taking government support schemes uh, while at the same time paying millions of pounds out to to shareholders. Um, now we do expect some of our companies that, that cut this year to, to actually pay specials uh, in later years and, and essentially therefore make up for it uh, in the future. Um, and I think it's not an entirely unfair trade-off, really. I mean, some of these government support schemes are, are really helping to protect profitability. Um, and I think the furlough schemes in particular are giving companies uh, really the best of both worlds when it comes to an ability to rapidly cut costs uh, in, in, in terms of staff without losing that ability to, to rapidly recover when things do turn. Um, and so what we're focusing on uh, primarily in this environment is the ability for these dividends firstly to bounce back uh, once the sort of political pressures do abate um, and then to see sustained growth uh, going forward um, and for that you need uh, strong balance sheets good mid to long term structural growth prospects um, and if we can combine that with uh, with market leading positions uh, where some of the competitors might might actually be weakened by by what we've seen uh, then so much the better um, I guess from a if we look at the wider market, we, we try not to take a big view uh, as, as to, to what happens in, in the wider market. We just focus on the companies we invest in. Um, but what we can say is that on average, our companies have stronger balance sheets. They've got better returns uh, and higher growth prospects um, than, than the average uh, company in Europe. And, and so that, that gives us a bit of confidence that um, when things do gradually return to, to more normal, um, that, that we can start to see an attractive uh, dividend and a, an attractive growth profile in those dividends as well. Thank you. Uh, and did you make any sales or, or acquisitions during the, the, the market sell-off? Um, so we generally have a low turnover approach. Um, so we would not usually expect to be making sort of lots of major changes to a portfolio, really in any circumstance. Um, and experience has taught us that, that knee-jerk reactions often prove to be uh, wrong um, a year or two down the line. So, so we try to really take a, a considered approach to this. Um, now, when, when things really started uh, heating up, um, what we did was we went through the portfolio stock by stock, just rechecking um, the liquidity, the balance sheets, um, the dividend cover, both, both earnings and, and free cash. Um, and then we spoke to the companies themselves just to see, you know, are there new areas of threat, um, given this is quite a unique uh, situation uh, that we find ourselves in. Now, on the back of that, there was one uh, sale from the portfolio. So we, we sold a company called Getlink, which uh, I think most people would uh, would know it by uh, by the name Eurotunnel. Um, now that had the most stretched balance sheet in the portfolio. I have to say, most of our companies have very very solid balance sheets. So to say it's the most stretched doesn't doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, it, it was stretched by sort of normal standards. Um, but we felt that in light of the kind of the very, very significant and, and really unprecedented hit to passenger numbers and to earnings um, that they could face covenant 
breach uh, there, depending on how things played out. Now, it was a bit, you know, it wasn't guaranteed. We weren't sort of sat there saying, yes, it's definitely going to hit these covenants. And of course, we don't know if those covenants would, would be waived or so on and so forth. But we, we're just allergic to kind of balance sheet risk. So as soon as it um, becomes even a question mark, um, we seek to exit. And so that we, we, we sold it that same day. Um, now, the good thing about our process is that we always have a sort of backup list of, of good quality companies uh, on the sidelines. And of course, when we see a, a market route like we did, that, that gives us an opportunity to sort of pick up other positions, um, which have perhaps been a bit um, unfairly hit. So, um, so we managed to do that. But I think mostly actually, um, where most of the sort of the inflows and so on went, was actually into existing positions, because that's where those are the companies we know the best. It's where we can have the conviction. Um, and, and we kind of know the management teams and so on there. And we know the business model. So we, we should be relatively secure uh, in the knowledge that these are good quality uh, businesses with, with good growth prospects. So I think, I think for all this talk though of, of, of things that we've done for the sales and the purchases and so on, um, we really haven't had to do very much uh, and our turnover is still very low um, because our style, which is, is focused uh, on high quality and growing businesses, um, that's just the best place to be when when the economic environment deteriorates. Um, so, so frankly, uh, we just take the view that if, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Um, and, and so, the portfolio is in really very, very similar shape um, to to the portfolio at the end of last year. Um, we mentioned a couple of companies, but but lots of the companies in which you invest in won't be familiar to our viewers. Um, are there a, a, a couple of your favourites you'd like to share with us? Uh, sure, I can. Uh, I can talk about companies till the cows come home. But uh, I guess to pick up a couple of the certainly the lesser known uh, uh, stocks. I mean, one of our companies is called Mention Machine. Um, it's it's actually an eight hundred million euro uh, market cap uh, business, but I think very few people have ever heard of it. Um, it's a German, uh, still run by the founder uh, and the CEO, Adi Drotleff. Um, and he and the management team, this is one of the things we really like to see in our companies, uh, they own more than half the company uh, themselves. So they're very well aligned uh, to, to the shareholder base. Um, and the company, so that they make computer-aided design uh, and manufacturing software. Um, so it helps you to build a virtual model uh, of a component uh, that you might want to make. Um, and then it tells the CNC machine, for example, uh, how to make it. So um, one of the examples they give uh, to show sort of how good this software is, um, there was a well-known car company um, who were making an engine component. Um, and it was taking them about three hours to make this engine component on their on their CNC machine. And when Mensch came in and said, you know, why don't you try our software? Um, they brought that three hour time down to two minutes. Um, so you can see that the, the sort of return on investment of, of a bit of software like that is, is really very big. Um, the other sort of interesting thing about uh, about mention and and, uh, and this environment is that one of their biggest barriers to sales, and, and they've been saying this for years uh, 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 since we sort of owned them, uh, is actually just getting time with the customer and getting time to prove what their software can do on the milling machines. Because you know, when the when the economy is booming, uh, you don't want any downtime in your milling machine. So uh, when when the mensch uh, salesperson comes and says, "Can I show you what we can?" do? Uh, the answer is sometimes no. Um, and so now things are slowing down somewhat. Uh, ironically, that, that actually um, is not a terrible opportunity uh, for, for Mench, and they, and they might be able to get a bit more sort of time in front of the customer. Um, I should say they, they, they're also the, the largest value-added reseller of Autodesk software in Europe. Um, and while that's a smaller smaller part of the business in, in profit terms, um, yeah, it's still a nice, steady, growing business. Um, and it has some synergies with, with, the, exist, with the other parts of the business to do, um, because Mench can provide kind of bolt-on modules to that, uh, to that software. So 
this is a business which, you know, despite everything that's happened, um, they are still uh, expecting to grow their net profit by between 18 and 24 percent this year. Um, in the next few days, they, they'll be paying out a dividend, which is is 30 percent higher than it was last year. Um, and they've already guided uh that uh, next year they expect to see the dividend go up another 20%. So um, it's a very attractive business, both both from a growth perspective, uh, but also from a, a dividend perspective as well. Um, I guess um, maybe, maybe the second example I'd, I'd highlight would, would be Medistim. Um, so this is a Norwegian company, um, and if we if we put it into euro terms, it would have a market cap of about three hundred seventy five million. So again, a, a smallish um, company in the scheme of things, um, and they make systems and probes um, which are used to measure and, and visualize the flow of blood um, when a surgeon is performing heart bypass surgery. Um, and so by being able to measure and, and see the blood flow in a, in a bypass, um, it means that if there's a problem, the, the surgeon can kind of stop and fix them there and then, which is a lot cheaper uh, than realising there's a problem after you've sewn them back up and, uh, and they've gone home, at which point you have to bring them back and, and, and things get very, very expensive. Um, now, the alternative uh, to using uh, a Medistim product, um, and, and rather scarily, the, the, the most common practice still in, in many markets, uh, including the UK and the US, um, is for the surgeon to, to literally use their finger uh, to feel the blood flow and to say, yes, okay, there's blood flowing through the bypass, uh, that will do. Um, now, clearly, that's quite a scary thought to begin with, but there's a large amount of clinical evidence now showing that, that Medistim's product not only improves patient outcomes uh, versus using, uh, using the fingers, um, but it actually saves the healthcare system money as well, uh, even in, including the cost of the system itself. So um, it's quite a compelling proposition. Um, now, Medistim, uh, they're the market leader, the dominant market leader in this space, um, and there are quite a few nicer sort of structural growth opportunities for them. So I mentioned the US earlier, uh, something like a quarter of the surgeries in the US use this system, um, and that would compare to, to something like 70 or 80 percent in, in the Nordics or Germany or Japan and so on. Um, so there's a, a large uh, penetration uh, opportunity there, um, and also in, in, in some emerging markets, uh, particularly China. Um, they then have a further opportunity um, in expanding into the vascular surgery uh, segment. That's another uh, one billion uh, Norwegian kroner uh, market opportunity, which they've, they've begun to develop, and, and so far that seems to be going quite well. Um, and then there's an opportunity in that... Um, yeah, a lot of their customers still only use the, the flow measurement product um, and, and the visualization product, which is newer, um, is, is something that I mean, Metastim are now trying to, to get the flow measurement uh, customers to use the visualization one too. So quite a few different growth drivers. Um, the probes themselves, because they're disposable, uh, they provide a nice kind of recurring revenue stream. Um, but we should say that that even this business uh, is likely to be impacted uh, in the second quarter particularly because we have seen surgeries um, be postponed uh, because the hospitals are sort of almost exclusively dealing with, with the COVID threat. Um, but of course, the, these operations, they, they can't be put off forever. Um, if you need a high heart bypass, you, you can't really wait for years and years to have one. Um, and so, we, we've got reasonable confidence that, that things will bounce back quite quickly um, once the sort of peak of the threat has passed. Um, this, this is an example um, of, of one of the companies that I, I sort of alluded to earlier where they've suspended the dividend at present, so it hasn't been formally cancelled, but at the same time, uh, what they've said is, the board has authority to pay it, um, but they will make that decision as to whether they will or not at a later date once things have kind of settled down. Um, but they do have net cash on the balance sheet, um, I think a, a pretty solid uh, business model as well. Um, and, and so I think our the sort of prospects of that business um, five or ten years from now are, are really as strong as ever. Um, 
and I think if we look to history as well, um, it it shows you you know why we mustn't sort of um, miss miss the wood for the trees um, because in two thousand and six, so before the financial crisis, the, the company was paying out a twenty seven uh, cents per share uh, dividend, um, and the proposal for twenty twenty was was. 2.75, uh, so that's a, a more than a 10 times higher higher dividend in that period. So we're not going to worry too much about, about a single year uh, and quite an exceptional year, as long as we can see that kind of longer term growth trajectory uh, is remaining strong. Um, and I, I noticed your fund fact sheet includes uh, a carbon intensity and a water intensity figure for the fund. Yeah. Uh, wondering what the significance of this is for investors and how long it's been monitored on the fund. Yeah. Um, well, this fund, even, even though it's not re- it's not marketed as an ESG uh, fund, we, we do have exclusions on, on companies that have sort of negative effects to society. So, um, companies involved in tobacco, gambling, weapons, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and so many of our, our clients actually do use it um, in, their, in their ethical portfolios. Um, and more fundamentally, we, we, we believe it is important to measure uh, the environmental data of the companies in the portfolio. So since the end of, of 2019, uh, we started to receive carbon and water data, um, and that, that comes from MSCI. And the purpose of that is to assess, uh, firstly, how much carbon um, is produced and how much water is used by our companies in in the running of their business. Secondly, which companies just aren't reporting uh, relevant or or accurate data, uh, whether it be on on carbon or water usage. Um, And then thirdly, we can then see which companies are the outliers um, and where is there therefore an opportunity to, to engage with them and hopefully improve the standards of, of their reporting uh, and, and maybe even enact some sort of long-term change. Um, so we're, we're, we're aiming to build this data set up over time. Uh, we want to see that that sort of, uh, and monitor that long-term change across the portfolio uh, and make sure that things are sort of moving in the right direction. Um, and as well as just being uh, a, a sort of responsible thing to do, um, you know, we also believe that companies that have good ESG practices, um, ultimately, they deliver better long-term returns, in, in our view, uh, and they, they tend to be more sort of sustainable businesses um, that, are, that are managed well. So um, it's just another part of the overall quality equation uh, that we look for when we're, when we're investing in a company. That's great. Thank you for chatting to me today, George. For more information on Montanaro European income, please go to fundcaliber.com.